go on the chat now. Something that repeats, Tim. That's a, yeah, that's a good thing. Something that repeats. So we've got an idea of repetition here. That's, uh, that's, that, that's a good thought. Um, so yeah, we're talking about repetition. It repeats itself in a certain way. I can get from what change in a regular way. That's right. Oh, yeah, change in a regular way. That's a good. Uh, that, that's a good bit of phrasing there. Um, so change, regular, repeat. These are all ideas that are floating around when we're talking about what we mean by a periodic structure. It's easier, perhaps, to maybe think uh, if you want to get more formal to think about things in terms of counterexamples. So I've given you one very simple, so I said one dimensional, obviously it's two dimensional, but one dimensional periodic structure. One of these things is periodic, the other one is not. Um, and now sort of we, we, we can get into this. What is it that we can do with one of these? What is it, what, what, how can we treat one of these things in a way that we can't treat the other one? So that's, this is the kind of idea that we're, we're, we're drilling down to. Imagine these, both of these things as just strips of paper. And I want to be able to show somebody using some kind of action. Copy, yes. Uh, so copy, in a sense. But what, is it, what does copy mean? What could I do with this as a, as a physical strip of paper to show you that the top one's periodic and the bottom one isn't? Thoughts. Yeah, just you just sort of visualize it. What could I what could I do? Well, in the top case, you can take a little piece of it and copy and paste it over and over again. But you can't on the bottom. That's the thing, yeah. No, exactly. So what we're saying is I can pick it up and I can shuffle it on two slots and I get the same thing. Imagine this this piece of paper is isn't it? So treat one piece instead of the whole. That's nice of this idea of, of copies. It's a lot of copies of a of a simple thing. Uh, but the idea is that there's some non-identity maps such that uh, such that I can keep on sort of mapping as a translation, and uh, I I can just keep on uh, keep on doing that, and it kind of maps to itself. It becomes the same thing, which I can't do with the bottom one. If I try and do the same thing, and we're to assume that this pattern carries on forever. Uh, then it doesn't. Uh, then it doesn't work. So we've got this idea of a periodic structure as uh, as a kind of a tiling or a pattern or a structure which I can which can map to itself over and over again. Um, so that's that's kind of useful. And because it can do that, I can kind of as 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 Marjan has suggested, uh, pack it up into into its uh, smaller repeating element. Okay, so that that's a way to think about it. Before we start getting into the theory of this, it's kind of rather important to talk about why we care about this stuff. We are, after all, and, uh, you know, there the A in DSDA stands for applications, and uh, we, we want to know why we're applying it. In this case, we're applying it to these big databases of theoretical and actual structures. This is a very familiar molecule to a lot of us called T2, uh, pictures taken from a publication, which actually a member of our group who's, who's now gone off to, uh, to, to John Cambridge was involved in. Uh, but initially, originally from uh, another group in this department in the, in the MIFS uh, work, predicting exactly how this molecule would crystallize out under different conditions. So these are mostly, apart from the five labeled ones these are all simulated crystals they've all it's all been done in silico um and you know this takes about sort of i, I believe it took about three months on a on a massive load of gpus and things so it's quite a complicated business but you're actually physically simulating how they turn out and these are all arranged uh by their kind of relative density and their lattice energy which is sort of some physical properties uh, so we've got these big parts of theoretical structures. We've got a huge database of, of, of actual structures, the Cambridge Crystallographic Structural Database is something some of you will be very familiar with, with over a million um, real deposited crystal structures in it. Um, and the reason we sort of care is because we want to make structural comparisons. So this makes kind of physical comparisons. We want to make structural comparisons. In some kind of way, what we would like and this is a very schematic idea, is this thing is going to crystallize into a repeating regular crystal periodically. OK, and uh, there's a sense in which the if you look at the central structure, there's a sense in which <clears throat> the structure on the left is more like uh, the structure in the middle than the structure on the right is. Um, and we want to be able to express that in a 
formal way. We want to be able to explore the space of possible structures because geometry can detect physical properties. A thing I might want to do with this molecule is make something that has a big hole in it, say, uh, that I can use to store methane or, or, or carbon dioxide, for example, which you, we can all uh, quite rapidly imagine why that's useful in the real world. So how do we make these geometric comparisons? That is the question. Ideally, we want to begin by saying, you know, can I discover when I've got two structures which are very similar like this, or two structures which are very different geometrically? And I want to say that geometry and, and I, you know, ultimately the holy grail is inverse design. So having kind of found a way to compare these two, I can situate them in some kind of space. We'll formalize that up in a moment. And ideally, I can kind of wander around that space and locate some physically realistic crystal with the kind of desirable structure that I might want. I might something with, might want something with a few more holes in it like this, bigger holes, rather than something a bit more complex like this, for example. And physically realistic is, of course, important. We have to be able to make these things. A lot of these things aren't physically makeable. Uh, so, so we do interact, in fact, with the physical properties of these. But we are concerned, in essence, with nothing more than trying to categorize the geometry of them, where all the pieces are. OK. And the basic toolkit we use for this is geometry, because we're thinking of these things essentially as points in space, just points. I mean, we put lines here, we put bonds here, but the concept of a chemical bond is a rather knotty one. Uh, and whether or not one exists is a question of things like electron density. So really, we will just want to think of atoms. We just want to think of points in space. And when we think of points in space, we think of vectors and vector spaces. We think of lengths and distances and angles and rotations and, and all the other tools that will be familiar to you from geometry. So this is the kind of basic toolkit that we have uh, We have together, a kind of spatial toolkit there. Uh, which means, and I've just got to stop here because we're going to use hopefully notation that this is all familiar to you, but we've got to be formal about it because notation is shorthand. And if you don't understand the shorthand, uh, then, then, then it can be difficult to follow. So we're just saying we're using, we're assuming if you want to get formal, uh, that we're operating in uh, a standard vector space, kind of standard Euclidean space, the space of coordinates and uh, that, that, that you learned even at school uh, with the standard notion of distances. So I can, I can uh, create the length in particular of a vector by uh, taking the square root of, sorry, that should be squared there, uh, taking the square root of its uh, of its squares. So the standard, this is kind of from Pythagoras' theorem, the standard distance, and also the notion of the inner product where I'm just taking the sum of its component wise multiples. Hopefully these are all familiar to you. And we represent our linear transformations as a matrix operating on a vector with components, you know, the i-th row and the j-th column. And we've got an identity matrix where it's just ones on the diagonal, um, which, which kind of doesn't change anything. Um, it, is this all familiar to everybody? Is anybody looking at that? That's, that's kind of absolute Greek to them at this point. It's fine if it is. This may not be something that you've, you've encountered, but hopefully um, I think, I, I think this is, these are things that are, that are fairly familiar. All good? Okay, good. Good. Nobody, I can't see. Just uh, just tap things in the chat or similar if you um, um, if you if you feel the need. Okay. Uh, now. Okay. So uh, I'm going to move on now to talk about the thing that I'm particularly interested in, and which is particularly simple, which is the lattice. Again, informally, we're talking about a set of discrete points in space with this periodic property. So I can go and kind of shuffle them in various directions and map them to themselves. So here we are, we can just, without any of the theoretical machinery, we're just thinking of them as a regular set of points in space. So hopefully that's all, um, that, that's all fine. Um, and uh, what the next question we want to ask is, how can we use these tools of linear algebra, these ideas of vectors um, and, and points in space to describe this? more formally. Okay, so we want to pack this up, have a nice finite description of this infinite structure. Any ideas, again, from, from, from some of our, our newer members, it's, a, it's kind of often it's as, as easy as it looks, do the, do the most obvious thing. Quickly check that I am in fact recording. So remember, we, we've got tools like 
<coughs> I do beg your pardon. We've got tools like vectors. Uh, we've got transformations. Some of you may be familiar with the idea of a linear basis. So the idea of, uh, and again, this, this goes, <coughs> you know, you can think of this fairly deeply choosing a basis um, in this space, uh, which is a set of linearly independent vectors. And by linearly independent, if we don't want to get too complicated, yes, linear combination, exactly, Marjan. We want to be able to say that we can pick a couple of vectors which aren't parallel to each other. So that in a sense, they are directions where they go in every, all of the possible directions in the space or something is a way to think about it. And then we induce a lattice as integer combinations of these vectors. So I can just add up, um, say, you know, two of these vectors and one of these vectors, and there I have a lattice point. And I just say, now, you will notice, by the way, those, those of you who are very much sick for notation will be twitching a little bit here um, because you're expecting to see vectors in bold or vectors with an arrow over them. Uh, we do cheat a little bit with the notation here, uh, precisely because when we're talking about things like lattices, there really isn't much of a theoretical difference. We don't gain much by making a, a, a strong distinction between the vector and the point at the end of the vector. The lattice is the point or it's the vector, um, whichever you like, and you can argue them both. So rather than clutter up the screen uh, with arrows or changing fonts or, or so forth, we'll, we'll, we'll just happily use U's and V's um, uh, interchangeably as though you, you might typically see them being used as a, as a kind of point at the end of a vector. Uh, so hopefully that's people are comfortable with that. Okay, so we can start to anatomize a lattice a bit. Uh, we can start to talk about this basis in closing a unit cell. So if I've got two vectors, I can close up the parallel pipette, as it were, um, and then I can take the determinant of the matrix whose columns are the basis vectors, and that is, again, this may well be familiar to you from basic linear algebra, the kind of volume, the signed volume, of the lattice. Uh, so so that, that kind of the volume enclosed by it. Um, there's another thing we can do, which we can take an area of the plane that is closer to any lattice, to, closer to a particular lattice point uh, than to any other lattice point in the cell. And that we get that's kind of a fixed thing. And of course, because the lattices are periodic, you can immediately see how, um, uh, how this thing is going to be just the same for every point. So you're going to get um, you're going to get a shape which tiles um, in this case R two in this case tiles the plane um, and it's going to be made out of just by a fairly simple um, argument planes bisecting the lattice vectors so we can just do the nearest points uh, so uh, or well planes or lines obviously uh, in higher dimensions a line is a kind of goes up to a plane uh, but this is the idea that we can so this is a couple of kind of shapes sort of two-dimensional shapes. We can make a unit cell, we can make a uh, this, this Voronoi cell, and both, um, both are of geometric interest. Um, and uh, this is where we get into notions of symmetry and lattice symmetries, because you'll notice that's, that's sort of something I haven't talked about, but it is something of, of, of some importance. Um, and the idea is that uh, the periodicity means that I can only arrange things in a certain matter, certainly in terms of where points are, uh, points are in relation to, to anywhere else. And uh, for reasons we, you know, it's, it's long been known that in, in two dimensions, uh, really there are only, uh, well, there are only four possible symmetric arrangements. I can't, I can't make any others. Uh, including kind of one without symmetry. So I can either arrange things in general position here, or I can make a lattice um, in which actually these are all equilateral triangles, but they might be hexagons, or I can make a square lattice, a rectangular one or a, a centered rectangular one. And if you look at the Voronoi cell shapes, that gives you kind of five possible shapes, this kind of skewed hexagon, a regular hexagon, although it's not kind of that regular there, a square, a rectangle, or a uh, or this sort of diamond shape. So uh, this um, kind of restricts. So one of the things to, to take home from this is that lattices are, um, lattices kind of decomplicate things in the sense that the requirement, that I must be able to translate these things, the requirement for sort of integer, uh, integer combinations of vectors actually rather limits the way you can arrange things in space, there are only so many symmetries. Whereas you can imagine, for example, if you just had a finite arrangement of points, I can make a hexagon, I can make a heptagon, I can make an octagon, I can 
I can make any, um, any symmetry I like. Okay. Uh, so just very quickly, and, and, and again, this is something that, uh, that, that those of you who will be working in this will, will get into, and, and, and I'll provide some reading on. Uh, in three dimensions, we have these 14 uh, Bravais lattices, and there are actually five possible polyhedra. I've taken an image here. Uh, you can quite happily, spend, and, and, and we do spend, spend quite a long time explaining why this is, uh, but I didn't particularly want to go down that byway. Um, but, 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 but again, I think that the message to take home here is that once you're in the world of lattices, uh, you're in a world of kind of limited, certainly in two and three dimensions, kind of limited symmetries, limited geometries, finite numbers of geometric array, of possible geometric arrangements, uh, which in some way simplifies these infinite structures because there's only a finite number of types of them, which we're now going to get into. What do I mean exactly by types? So, so I've kind of blithely talked about saying, oh, well, there's only these possible lattices, but there aren't really, there's a lot of ways of arranging a lattice. So here's, um, here's three lattices. Um, and uh, do we all think they are the same? Perhaps the new uh, individuals uh, would like to take a vote. Does anybody think that they are not the same? Anybody stick a hand up if they think that they are not the same? Cool, and stick a hand up if you think they are the same or if not. So there are all these three lattices, the same lattice. And if you want to put in the chat why, if they are, or what the differences are, if they're not. This is kind of, in a sense, the trick question. It's, it's correct to answer, of course they're not, they look different, because we haven't really defined what the same means. But if you want to say they're the same, it might be interesting to you same just chosen different vectors to make the lattice yes so dan makes the point here dan makes the point here uh, so we might have chosen different vectors but we're making the same lattice in some sense okay and uh what that sense is i mean we'd like that what, what what we mean i suppose when we say they are the same is we'd like them to be if we're to talk in any meaningful sense about a lattice um, about lattices, we'd like all three of these to be the same because the dots are in, sort of in the same position relative to each other. In essence, the relative positions of the actual lattice points don't change, but we've got a diff. But remember, all the way back when we started, the only the way we found to describe where these dots are are in terms of basis vectors, and we pick different basis vectors. So if you look at the basis vectors, you'd say no, they're not the same. But if you looked at where the dots were, you'd say, uh, yes, there are. And in fact, there are an infinite number of possible choices describing the same lattice because I can rotate this. All I've done here is rotate it. All I've done here is picked a different set of vectors. And I slightly cheated uh, to make this trickier for you. If I expanded this out or put another few rows in, you would immediately see it's slightly less obvious because I put in these spurious guidelines, which help you understand where the lattice basis vectors are going. But, um, but you would you would immediately start seeing if I expanded this that, that you'd be looking you're looking at the same thing you're looking at just regularly uh, spaced uh, you know a, a grid of regularly spaced points. I kind of want to ignore this bit for now. I'll get to the end. The, the, so the changing of basis vectors. So the fact that you can change both you can change the angle between the basis vectors and still get the same lattice um, is what throws in the big complications here. So I want to kind of get towards that bit at the end. Uh, what I want to start with though, is talking about the formal tools uh, that, that, are, that are involved with this relation between these two uh, lattices on the left. And we're talking here about things like isometry and rigid motion. And remember we defined the length of a vector here um, earlier with our notation. And what we're saying is that we want some linear map, uh, which you can think of as a, as a matrix, uh, that doesn't affect the distances. So if I've got a pair of vectors um, and I, uh, or points or similar, and I apply the linear map, then the distances don't change. Okay. Um, and we, we slightly differentiate, although I'm not going to, to, to go into it too much here because it adds, a, adds an additional complication, uh, is that we can dis distinguish between uh, that in a rigid motion, which means that there's some continuous family of isometries that start with the identity and end. 
Um, so a rigid motion is a thing like a rotation, where I can turn this to the left, um, and a, uh, a, ro a and where I can kind of keep turning this uh, continuously, you know, by a tiny angle and a tiny angle and a tiny angle, and there's this family that gets me from one to the other. Whereas a reflection, certainly in two dimensions, I can't, I can't do that. To get from this triangle to this triangle, the distances haven't changed. So, so that in isometry, I've just reflected it in this axis. But I have had to do something that is illegitimate. I can't kind of, yeah, you, you want to kind of pick it up and turn it over. But of course, we're trapped in the plane, so we can't, we can't do that. Okay, so that's that's isometry and uh, rigid motion. And we want to say that this is an equivalence. And I'm gonna guide you through the idea of how we formally say that these lattices are the same because that's where we get our, uh, get our basic tools from. Okay, so I want to talk about equivalences. Now this hopefully is very familiar to you. So I'll go through it reasonably quickly, uh, but I would like the new, newer people to, um, uh, to perhaps join in and have a crack, or if you're if if you want to kind of revisit this question yourself, um, to 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 have a crack at kind of applying this to isometry. So as we go through all these properties of equivalence, say to yourself, do things like rigid motions or isometries um, have this? Okay, so do they have all of these properties? So an equivalence is my three properties, and they're the sort of properties you get for the equal sign, which is why they're called equivalences. One of these properties is called reflexivity. I say that if I've got a set of anything, any set. So again, we're forgetting about lattices, we're just going for a set. And I'm saying that an equivalence is some relation on that set where I can pick two members. So it's a relation. So I, I can ask, is X in a relation to Y or is X not in a relation to Y? And the first property is X is always in relation to itself. It is always true that X is in relation to itself. So again, uh, a couple of minutes there. If somebody, uh, particularly those who are familiar with this, I know Tin will be because I've, I've dropped this in a in a uh, in a lecture, perhaps. Although there much has happened since then, uh, do we have? Can we have an isometry? Well, I, does isometry um, involve uh, uh, reflexivity? If I say, um, is, is isometry an equivalence relation in the in the sense that? something is isometric to itself. So we're looking for an, an isometry that, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little pressed for time, so, so, so I might have to, have to hustle on. Yes, so, so I, yes, it, there it is. But why? Why? Because we have an, uh, because we have the identity matrix, okay, and the identity is an isometry, okay, so I, I can, uh, if two, we say two things are isometric, if there is an isometry between them, and the, the identity is an isometry. If I don't do anything to a pair of vectors, say, or to a triangle, or to some something geometrically, then I'm not changing any distance. So, so the thing is uh, equivalence to itself. Okay, so if two things are isometric to each other, um, and the important thing about this is what it does to items in the set is it makes sure everything is classified. Okay, so in the end, I'm trying to use these equivalences to classify objects, lattices, say. So, so let's say, say, since every lattice is equivalence to itself, every lattice belongs to some class. I can say, if I'm looking about for all the things that are equivalent to a particular lattice, there is at least one thing that is in that class and that is the lattice itself, okay? The next thing we've got is symmetry, okay? Uh, rather harder to think about in terms of isometries, but we're saying that what, what it means is that, is that the relation works forward or backwards. If X is related to Y, Y is related to X. And do we have that? And the answer is we do. Um, I realize now go through it that, that probably without going into some deep linear algebra, there's no, well, deepish linear algebra, there's no, there's no easy way to say this, but yes, you do. Okay. And you can think of it informally as saying that I can always, if I've rigidly moved something around in space, I can always rigidly move it back to where it was. Uh, so formally, we'd say that these, these transformations are invertible. So, um, and what that does to a set of things is it means you can never escape classification. Nothing escapes classification, okay? As soon as something is in a class with something else, it is in that class with it, as it were. So, so, so it always expands. We always, we always yeah, there's, there's no escaping it. 
And finally, we have this rather fun thing here, transitivity, which is slightly more complicated and usually the most complicated thing to prove, which is that, um, that if I've got X, Y, and Z, and X is equivalent to Y in some sense, and Y is equivalent to Z, then X is equivalent to Z. And what that does to a set here, again, you've classified everything belongs in a class, nothing ever gets out of a class. And if I find two classes overlapping, transitivity pops that bubble and immediately says they are in, hopefully I've done this right, they are in the same class. They have to be. So there's no such thing as, a, as an intersection, which means I've classified everything. I found an equivalence relation, I can classify everything. And just quickly, yes, again, you can see this, you can see the image of the idea, um, even though proving it is a little more formal, that if I take a as an object in space and I move it around without changing the distances and I move it again without changing the distances, you know, it's still isometric. So, so, um, so transitivity holds. Okay. And our final formal tool here is that if we've got an isometry, if two things are isometric, if two lattices are isometric, then what I want to find between them is an invariant. Okay, now in a very, very general sense, an invariant is a function, say from the set of all lattices, uh, to something. And I'm being very general about this. Often it's a number, in, in some cases it's a set of numbers, it could be anything. But the point is that if I, um, if I denote by kind of, I'm going to do some quick, rather, rather sloppy shorthand here, and say that, you know, if I've got a linear transformation of some sort, whether it's an isometry or not, I can kind of transform the lattice by creating the lattice generated by, uh, by the two transformed vectors. Okay, and if A is an isometry, uh, any isometry, and if I've got a function on the lattice, and, um, and that function on the lattice, if the function on two lattices are the same, that means I can guarantee that those two lattices are isometric. Okay, uh, so that's what, that's what that is. Okay, it's, it's an isometry test in this sense, is an isometry invariant. So an invariant is only invariant relative to some property, in this case isometry, being the same lattice up to some, uh, up to some change of, uh, up to some change of, well, up to some isometry, up to some kind of shifting about in the space. And then I finally say that it's complete that the converse is true. That is the only way in which the, the only lattices which are isometric are the, uh, are, have the same value, whatever this value is in the set X. Uh, quick question for you, uh, for, for, for Newby Sigma, this is quite a complicated one talking about isometry and complete isometry invariants. Is the area of a triangle an isometry invariant? The area of a triangle an isometry invariant is question one. And question two, is it complete? Again, I encourage uh, the, the new, uh, the new people here to maybe have a have a little go at this, particularly if they haven't encountered if they haven't encountered the idea before. Remember what we mean here is: Am I saying the area of a triangle? If I if I have a function that gives me the area of any triangle, just as a number, this is a function as a number. And I see that, um, and I and I see that uh, the I've got two. I've got two um, isometric triangles. So to check that it's an invariant, if I've got two isometric triangles, if I've got two triangles with the same distances between all the points. Am I going to get the same area out of them? That's one way around. To have it complete, I have to say that if I've got two values, if I, if I do my test, if I have my function that gives the area on two triangles, can I be absolutely sure that the only situation on which are, under which I get the same area is that they're complete? Is, is that they're, sorry, is that they're isometric? Any thoughts? So you had yes to which? Yes to the first question or yes to the second? Or yes to both? 
Thank you, sorry, yes to the first. Yes, thank you, by the way, sorry, I should say first, thank you for answering. Um, yes, yes to the first. What about the second? And if not, why not? Or if so, why? So I think people are thinking about this. The answer is uh, is 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 that the second is, is obviously not complete. There's a, it is fairly obvious that if I have two isometric triangles here, so these two iso two triangles related by an isometry, I've just kind of rotated and shifted it a bit, and I haven't changed the height and I haven't changed the width of the base, and that's how you calculate the area of a triangle. So obviously these two are going to be the same, but it is fairly easy to imagine plenty of different tri triangles with the same area without the same. Uh, with, with a, that, that are not isometric. So we've got an isometry invariant, but not a complete one. And this is what we will commonly find. Complete invariants are extremely hard to find, or, or often uh, when they are found, extremely hard to describe or compute. Uh, whereas, um, or they're kind of trivial, that uh, they, 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 don't, they don't help us classify things except make everything different. Uh, but the, um, but invariants themselves, um, can still be useful, even if, even if we don't have a guarantee uh, that they always and only spot that, it, that the, the relationship goes both ways. So I want to, basically, we've, we've, we've kind of gone deep on a couple of tools, just so you can see the kind of reasoning we start to use and the kind of proof, but just to go back up, this is a very, very general picture of the idea of what we're doing. Uh, what we want to say is, if we've got, if I can map a lattice to some isometry invariant, this should have gone in front, uh, then that means that all of these lattices, which we want to be the same, all live, and you can imagine this arrow going here, all, um, all map to the same point in some set, okay? And lattices with kind of interesting symmetries or interesting uh, ideas. Uh, and we, ideally we want it to be up to change of basis as well, but we will talk about that in a second, um, is that, um, is that lattices with kind of higher symmetry we want to be able to find lattices with interesting structures exist in some subspace and we want to kind of move around and this is the kind of space we want to explore so we want to go from this infinite space of choices of lattices and crunch it down to um to a space of invariance and what do i mean by space and moving around if i've been rather cagey about that because that's a general thing we get into the idea of metric so a metric is a thing that generalizes the idea of distance um and I'm just kind of showing you how that works. Um, and a distance is a thing where you take two things and spit out a real number. Um, in the, the case we're used to, the uh, real, the kind of straight line distance between two points, but it could be any two things spitting out to a real number, just as long as it's a real number. Um, and that it is, um, and that if I have kind of three things in this set, the only way I can get the distance between two things being zero, is that they're the same? Who can spot a typo on the metric slide? I've made a typo, haven't I? Um, can anyone stop, spot a typo on the metric slide? Um, I've made it, I, I just, yeah, less or equal. Yes, yes, no, that's supposed to be, um, yeah. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's what, yeah, it's supposed to be, ah, oh, whoops, yeah, that's supposed to be less than or equal to, kind of have a look at it here. So, yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, the DXY, so we've got symmetry here, again, so we've got something a bit like, um, we've got something a bit, a bit like reflectivity here, two points that have a zero distance, only the same, otherwise it's positive. And actually, this this guarantees the other met, the other axioms guarantee positivity. The distance between A and B is the same as the distance between B and A. And this triangle inequality here, which is just you know for all three points, if I go via some third point, I'm going at the very least the same distance and usually longer. And again, it's called the triangle inequality because it's kind of illustrated here. So. Very quickly, and we want these distances to be continuous, which is the big complication, which is where we get into the complication of bases, which I'll quickly run through. So if I've got an isometry invariant, so I'm mapping these lattices to a space, ideally, if I just jiggled these points around a bit by some little delta, I would like for I would like um, 
the invariant, the value of the invariant, not to have changed very much. So we're kind of given away in a way that our, our, our invariants are kind of numeric in essence, and that there's a metric on them. And by not changing very much, that means that I've equipped this invariant space with a metric. And that if I measure the distance between two invariants when I've just done this, I've just made this, um, then it's, it's, it's small informally and formally is less than some constant times that we get into analysis here, which I'll, I'll, I'll not go into, but, we, um, but less than some constant, constant times the amount I've moved, um, I've moved the lattice. Okay, and so we want these continuous complete invariants and metrics if we want them, but importantly, we want them to be easy to compute. Remember, we're applying this practically. Uh, it, it does you no good, it takes forever to compute these, or they're kind of complicated to, to, to explain or represent. So the question is, where might we find them? And I'm now going to start going into some depths and do you a quick Cook's tour of where you can find these and also kind of our own ideas of where we found them for lattices. So for lattices, obviously the length spectrum uh, is a complete isometry. Since isometries by definition don't change length, uh, don't change lengths. If I take the, the list of lengths between every point, the list of distances between a point at the origin say and every point, so the length of every single vector, in this infinite set of vectors, okay? That won't change. That's obviously an isometry invariant because lengths don't change under any isometry, okay? And indeed, it is a complete isometry invariant. This was proved surprisingly recently, again, in three dimensions. In one dimensions, it's quite easy to prove. In two dimensions, the proof takes about a paragraph. In three dimensions, the proof, um, the, the shortest explanation in English of the proof, it came out of a German thesis in 2015, uh, was published last year. And I've seen it's about 30 pages long, it employs complex topological arguments. It's a computer proof um, in the sense that its basic statement is that a certain algorithm um, will only terminate if, a, uh, if, if, if this is right, if, if the length spectrum is a complete isometry invariant, and indeed it does terminate. Um, now, uh, Conway and Sloan, there's a counterexample in four dimensions, um, and any counterexample is provably a counterexample in higher dimensions, so this stops being true up to three, but yes. Now, the problem with this, of course, is it's not particularly easily computable because it's an infinite list, um, and there is no, as far as I'm aware, no particular proof that you, you can get away with anything else. So the next kind of obvious question is, how long does the list have to get of these distances before you can stop and say, I've uniquely categorized a lattice, and there is no particular reason to believe at the moment that there is um, any such limit. Uh, that you can that, that, that you can stop that in fact that this is an infinite and infinite things are not very useful because they're hard to store they're hard to compute and we don't know uh, much about them okay so um, so length so so let's think about lengths and angles and this is where we get to so we can define things like the metric tensor here this is the classic crystallographic thing and we can do this in two and three dimensions uh, so we can take the two lengths they should be squared and uh, and the inner products. Um, as it were. And these values aren't going to change because they're all related to the lengths and angles of the vector. So they're going to be isometry invariants. Okay. So fine, that's where we start. But we've, I, I'm going to very quickly, so, but, but I've kind of waved away the basis problem. I asked you to forget about that, but we've got to come back to it. Because the question here is, yes, obviously I can choose any set of basis I like. Here's a lattice, here's every conceivable possible basis, and there's an infinite number of choices provided they're linearly independent. But what we do, uh, and what chemists do, um, is they pick one. Okay, uh, it is not hard to pick one. And how you pick one is you create a set of geometric conditions which uniquely specify a basis. Okay, uh, so, for example, in two dimensions, we can say something like we choose the angle closest to 90 degrees uh, is a very informal way of putting it. All this is a set of algebraic conditions. OK, this set of algebraic conditions gives you this should be a minus here. I'll just correct that. Um, but we have a final uh, special condition because we end up in these kind of symmetric situations uh, where we get an ambiguity still. And this is where these things become equalities as it were. So we, we get kind of equalities and we have to take a, uh, a special condition when, when the two, uh, two vectors are the same. And these special conditions are what create our complications because reduction conditions on a space, this is called a reduction for, for reasons we'll, we'll discuss, reduction conditions on a space with a metric uh, specify some subset of that space. Okay, 
So I've got um, kind of inner products, got a list of, um, of inner products here, say for example, and then I, um, and then the reduction conditions specify some subset, some subset of the space. Uh, so, so we get a kind of a finite space to explore. Um, and the equalities, the ambiguities mean that there's more than one point in the space that represents the same lattice in essence. And the special conditions tell you how to choose what happens at duplicated edges, which creates, which can create a problem if I'm trying to explore this space um, continuously. Uh, because I, I head for an edge, as it were, if I'm asking a question about how I slightly change a lattice and I head for an edge, I might find myself popping along to uh, a completely different point of the space. For informally or schematically, the way to think about this is if I'm calculating the value of an invariant here, here I am uh, gently changing a lattice, continuously changing a lattice. So I'm kind of moving this, you can imagine just me tilting this through space and my special conditions um, pop the lattice out. Um, so so as, I go, as I pass through this, uh, my, special, sorry, my special conditions as, as I pass through this symmetric position and I move it slightly, but my kind of choice automatically say, say here I'm choosing some sort of obtuse angle, changes some. Okay, and that means the value, if I, my values are based on lengths and angles, the invariant changes. Uh, changes suddenly, and that's not good. Remember, we want this, this kind of continuous exploration of the space uh, so that we've got a view of these structures. Um, and it turns out just very quickly, I won't go through my own results now, that the answer is to add this additional vector and require obtuse angles. In two dimensions, this is, this is unique. So I just, I just add an additional vector. I say I have three vectors, two lattice vectors and the, their negative sum. In two dimensions, it's kind of unique up to sign. In three dimensions, things get more complicated. And then my invariant is the square root of the negative inner product of these three vectors. So V0, V1, V2, and then I kind of order them. And this we can prove in a general sense is a, is a kind of continuous invariant. Um, and we can use that to explore the invariant space. So now I've suddenly got three numbers. So I can explore this as a space in three dimensions. So that's how, that's how we worked this idea. Um, and uh, I can further compress it into two dimensions by ignoring scale. In fact, in this three dimensional space, if I move outwards, all I'm doing is kind of growing a lattice by a constant factor. So this is just roughly what the invariant space looks like. And uh, uh, you can see this as sort of, uh, this is, so we, we've, we've kind of got to the end of this, but the, the, the take home here that, that I'll mention again quickly at the end is that, um, that this is that we've had to deal with all sorts of complications and make some decisions about uh, 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 make some uh, to to kind of get finally a full uh, a full description of this invariant space from which I can now explore two dimensional lattices. So you can imagine moving around this space uh, will give me a lattice of some description here up to scale. If I'm moving around this three dimensional space, it'll kind of uniquely specify a lattice. Um, and then I can sort of start measuring distances on it, which it doesn't exactly, um, and I'll not go into this because we're, we're running out of time, but, uh, but it doesn't exactly solve the boundary problem completely, but what it does is reduce it to the idea of finding shortest distances among in a finite number of different directions. So if I want to find the, the difference distance between two points, I kind of have to look at reflections in boundaries. Um, so, so I've kind of simplified the problem at very least. And so look at all of that happened for kind of two dimensions. Uh, all, and all of this is just for two dimensional lattices. When we go up to three dimensions, the superbase is not quite unique, although possible, all possibilities can and have been categorized. So, so we've got a kind of non-uniqueness. And the invariant space here, rather than being this nice triangle, is a rather, is, is a, has been kind of long investigated. There's, there's, um, and it's a, it's a six dimensional cone with some very complex internal structure, which we're, we're kind of dealing with. In dimensions four and above, that gets even more complicated. And you get a funny thing where superbases can't be computable using the methods of two and three dimensions. Uh, there's a lovely quote by, by Bill Thurston, which I like here about four dimensions, giving you enough room to get into trouble, but not enough to get out of it. As soon as you get to higher dimensions with this than three, which fortunately chemists very rarely care about, the, um, uh, the, the, 
certain theoretical constructs fall, fall over and you can't quite do the same thing. Um, it's to do with kind of ordering of, of short, you can guarantee that the three shortest vectors in a three-dimensional lattice are linearly independent, form some sort of basis. You can't, one, one of the reasons that this falls over is you can't guarantee that in four dimensions or higher. You might in the, among the four shortest vectors have two that are parallel. Um, so Dan, I haven't given you very much time. Do you want, do, have, how long? Have you got okay? So, so Dan works. So, I've, I've done this all about lattices. That's just a single point. What happens when you throw in X points when you actually do real chemical structures? Well, generally, then you have to start putting points inside the unit cell, so motif points with uh with fractional coordinates inside the unit cell, and then you have to start kind of dealing with those. Uh, do people have time to stick around for like maybe five or ten minutes more? Matt, uh, may I clarify? Um... Dan, would you like to talk um, maybe next time uh, for yeah, longer? Or, what um, did you plan? I have a few slides. It would take us a bit over, but in the interest of time and also a conceptual overload, it might be better yeah. to, to, to leave it. Or something. Sure. No, I suggested to Dan that we. I think mainly to show to show our collaboration that, that I'm using just one example and to show how other examples are. Okay. Well, I did have a very quick summary just in case just in case this this came of my understanding of it, and you can give me a slap if I've not <laughs> fully understood it. Uh, but the idea here is that we go back to this idea of the length spectrum, um, in essence here, and this becomes a rather more um, so so we start to talk about distances. But in this case, rather than you know, obviously we take any point in the lattice and the distances are all the same. Uh, in a uh, in, in in a periodic point cloud, as it were, in a standard one, we have to take um, all the distances um, from all of the different point centers and combine them into a matrix. Uh, the distance between matrices, though, there's lots of ways of doing that. There's a thing called the Earth Movers distance, which uh, which we've talked about, uh, which and we can start, and, and this is where we start getting into. Um, into this sort of thing. And you'll notice that the handy thing about length spectrums or length spectra uh, is that they are quite agnostic in this sense to how I choose a, a unit cell. I still have to pick a point. Uh, I still have to pick all the points that are kind of different in a sense within the, within the unit cell. And I still have to start measuring all their distances of this kind of unit cell uh, agnostic in a sense, uh, which, is, which is what's useful about length spectra. So I just want to quickly talk about what we what we take away here from that, which is not necessarily the, the, the great conceptual details necessarily, that's just getting into it, but that formally we've got these periodic structures which map to themselves under repeated iterations of some non-identity map, identity map. And what I want you to take away from this is periodic structures are remarkably easy to describe, but very hard to describe uniquely, precisely because of this kind of basis selection, because there are lots of different ways in which we can describe that, that periodic map. But unique description is a first step in finding these complete continuous invariants, which allow us to explore and sample from the space of periodic structures. And so going back to the beginning of why we're all doing this, helping chemists to, uh, to, to pull out structures that will be of use to them simply by exploring the space of, of, of possible geometries. And, uh, and that's it. That's my uh, introduction to... Um, that, 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 that's our introductory talk. And I hope that that has been edifying. Again, the, you know, there isn't gonna be a test on this. It's just an, an introduction to the complexities and, and an example. So the idea, so those of you who are new and will be working on this, you will of course have plenty of time, weeks and weeks to get to grips with this in a more leisurely fashion. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but you are very welcome to ask questions now or to come to, to me or, or, and, and ask questions later. Matt, thank you very much. Let us uh, first thank Matt for his nice presentation. Stop sharing, yeah. I'm gonna stop recording. Uh, yes, um, however, just in case you could keep your slides for a moment, in case uh, anyone oh, has questions, of course, yes, of um, which might be easier to answer with your slides. So, especially new students, uh, any questions? So it's so it's really important for you to to ask questions. Yeah, so, <clears throat> because we are learning by by asking. <laughs> 